So you should have this. Um, Gene Sharp. So we're, we're starting to get to know him a little bit. Um, I don't know if any of you read this book, but this is the, the one that I used in the other course. Um, so. Sorry about this. This is the old number for this course. Uh, 460 is a brand new number assigned. This one, there's a bunch of um, courses under that number, so we got our own number. Anyway, uh, Gene Sharp is someone very interested in power and how to seize it back uh, without violence. Um, so two views of power here. This is the, uh, the definition of power I usually use, say, in political science. The ability to get someone to do something they otherwise wouldn't. If you get someone to do something they were going to do anyway, that's not really power. It's getting them to do something else, something that is against their own interest. So whether you do that by force, whether you do that by persuasion, um, there's all kinds of ways that you can get people to do things, your charms. Um, but however you do it, if, if you're able to do it, that's a form of power. Uh, but there are two views of power. Um, one is a sort of uh, realist. In, in political science, there's realists and idealists. So the realists uh, focus on the way things really are, whereas the idealists focus on the way things should be in their, in their view. How can we make change? How can things be better? Uh, it's a bit of a dreamer orientation, whereas realist is very much, uh, how do I use the system the way it is actually now for my own benefit? A realist view would say that power is emitted by the few who stand at the pinnacle of command, so a top-down view of power. But um, another view of power is that it's more from the bottom up, continu continually rising from many parts of the society, <coughs> fragile, always dependent on uh, for, for its strength, an existence upon a replenishment by the cooperation of a multitude. Okay, nonviolence is based on the second of these views. Okay, so that's interesting. If the first view is correct, then maybe nonviolence is not effective, although we have many examples of it being effective, so it seems that the second view is at least partially correct. The Source There Empire is a, a book that I uh, think I'm going to talk about in the next lecture tonight. Um, that was kind of the, the book everybody was reading about 15 years ago in um, sort of political theory. Uh, it had a very left-wing and idealist view of power. Uh, I talked a bit about Foucault two lectures ago. Um, so we know a little bit about him. Foucault says, there's no power relation without the correlative constitution of a field of knowledge. So we talked about Foucault before, but um, not so much about his view of power knowledge, power slash knowledge. We just say power knowledge, that power and knowledge are always linked. Um, Krishna talked about that. right? So there's no power without a corresponding field of knowledge, nor any knowledge that does not presuppose and constitute at the same time, power relations. So this is that view that uh, is related to that notion of discourse, that power is created through a story or a narrative. Right? A, a story gets told, and, and that's why you see, like on the news, the sort of drumbeat for some um, catchphrase that keeps getting repeated over and over again. right? Like uh, when there's government corruption, all of a sudden all the pundits are saying, Oh, that's just bad apples, bad apples all the time. And you see it like dozens and dozens and dozens of times across all these channels. All these, um, usually, I think it was Republicans saying, and then the commentators saying, oh, it's just bad apples. It's not a systemic problem. They kept using the term bad apples. So that's like a narrative, right? It's a story. It's a discourse. So discourse is a form of power. Discourse is a place where power relations are are exercised. So that's why um, academia, which might seem like uh, to some people 
a kind of irrelevant um, uh, world, right? The ivory tower. Here's the term of the ivory tower. Uh, professors are out of touch. But actually, because academics are part of this discourse that enters the mainstream society, they do actually exercise some measure of power. In fact, right here on my little projector here, it says power, so I know that it's true. <laughs> okay, um, actually, let's take a look at uh, Foucault and some of his ideas. Standard 
18th century, a professional doctor was born named Hippos, a sinister figure who remembered the patient always with what he could call the medical gaze, denoting a dehumanizing attitude that looked at a patient just as a set of organs, not a person. One was, under the medical gaze, merely a malfunctioning kidney or liver, not a person to be considered as a whole entity. Next, Hippos found what came discipline and punish. Here, Foucault did his standard thing and escaped punishment. Again, the war maker said the prison and punishing systems of the modern world are so much more humane than they were in the days when people just used to be hung in public squares, and not so on their people. The problem, he said, is that power now looks kind or isn't, whereas in the past it clearly wasn't kind, and therefore could encourage open rebellion and protest. Foucault noted that in the past of the execution, convict's body could become a focus of sympathy and admiration, and the executioner, rather than the convict, could become a locus of shame. Also, public executions often led to riots in support of the prisoner. But with the invention of the modern prison system, everything had to be private, under locked gates. One could no longer see and therefore resist the state power. That's what made the modern system of punishment so barbaric and properly primitive in Foucault's eyes. Foucault's last work was the multi-volume History of Sexuality. The maneuvers he performed in relation to sex are again very familiar. Foucault rebelled against a view that we're all meant to be liberated and at ease with sex. He argued that since the 18th century, we have relentlessly medicalized sex, handing it over to professional sex researchers and scientists. We live in an age of what Foucault called scientia sexualis, science of sexuality. But Foucault looked back with considerable nostalgia to the cultures of Rome, China, he detected the rule of what he called the Ars Erotica, erotic art, where the whole focus was on how to increase the pleasure of sex rather than merely understand and believe it. Once again, modernity was blamed for pretending there had been progress when there was, in fact, just a loss of spontaneity and imagination. Hugo wrote in the last volume of his work, While Dying of AIDS, that he had contracted in a San Francisco gay bar. He died in 1984, age 58. Foucault's lasting contribution is to the way we look at history. There are lots of things in the modern world that we're constantly being told are fantastic, and they were apparently very bad in the past, for example, education, or the media, or our communication system. Foucault encourages us to break away from the optimistic smugness of that now, and to go back and see in history the many ways of doing things which were perhaps superior. Foucault wasn't trying to get us to more nostalgia. He wanted us to pick up some lessons of way back in order to improve Academic historians have tended to hate Foucault's work. They think it inaccurate and keep pointing out things getting yeah, quite understood in some document or other. But Foucault didn't care for total historical accuracy. History for him was just a storehouse of good ideas, and he wanted to raid it rather than keep it pristine and untouched. We should use Foucault as an inspiration to look at the dominant ideas and institutions of our times and to question them by looking at their histories and evolutions. Foucault did something remarkable. He made history life-enhancing and philosophically rigid. He can be an inspiring figure for our own projects. So what does this have to do with our course? Well, Foucault's um, ideas can be very um, liberatory to uh, those who are not in power, like indigenous people. Any questions about Foucault? How many of you already uh, came across Foucault or read him? Okay, a few people. So um, as he said, uh, Foucault is popular among students studying at university. So if you go off now, you can say you've been exposed to Foucault. Um, and School of Life is very handy for um, a quick uh, sort of primer on all these philosophers. and. Um, uh, they have uh, they have a lot of a lot of stuff, but um, the thing about Foucault is that his ideas um, they cut across disciplines. You, you'll find his work 
being used in English, in history, political science, anthropology, sociology, pretty much all of the humanities and social sciences. Um, and I think that video is a little bit dismissive of his work. He really, uh, he really became very important because all those projects that he did, each book was part of a, a larger project, which is about the nature of power. So very, very useful if you're trying to understand power in order to be able to um, re uh, resist against it if that power is oppressive. So Foucault, he's often used among um, uh, by scholars of indigenous studies. Uh, just to go back a little bit historically into the understanding of oops. <laughs> I teach online, and that's my old way of getting the content across was a voiceover. Um, older views before Foucault of power, basically, um, power was something that people submitted to because they were trying to get out of what they called the state of nature. Uh, state of nature was life as it was without any government. So according to the, the first theorist on this state of nature, uh, Thomas Hobbes, Life in the state of nature was solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Uh, so he had a pretty negative view of the state of nature. And then you had uh, a second theorist, John Locke, pretty important theorist. Uh, American democracy is partly based on his ideas. He had a kind of a middling view. He said you wouldn't give up. State of nature is not that bad. And you would only give up uh, your rights, your natural rights that you still have in the state of nature, if those rights are, are preserved by the government, all people have natural rights to life, liberty, and property. And you see that in the American Constitution. When they say life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that was just a euphemism for property, actually. Um, uh, Thomas Jefferson almost put property in there. And then he just thought, that sounds too materialistic, so he said pursuit of happiness. But he, he assumed that happiness came from owning a property like Monticello, where he lived, right? Really nice property. Uh, and then there was a third theorist, uh, Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, also very influential in the American Revolution and the French Revolution, of course. And he said that the state of nature was actually better than civilization. So he is the person who came up with the term noble savage, that uh, the indigenous people, <laughs> they're calling a savage, were uh, these noble characters. And you start to see that theme, say, in um, American films and so on, that uh, the native is actually superior, more dignified than the so-called civilized person. You start to see that theme in the uh, uh, 20th century. Um, keep in mind, none of these people had experienced the state of nature, if what we mean by that is the way that indigenous people live in a traditional way, that there's no uh, wilderness, there's already communities, right? There's tribal communities or early civilizations in the case of uh, uh, the Near East and even Polynesia. Okay, so that's where it kind of links to what we're talking about. Um, there are those who sort of take Rousseau even to an extreme and say that uh, it's better if we just abolish government, anarchists, right? You see, sometimes you see this symbol, I don't know, in the 80s, the punk rock scene, you saw a lot of that, anarchy. Uh, when I was at Cornell doing that presentation that I did last week, one of the professors who invited me was uh, a history professor who taught a course on anarchy. And he was an anarchist because in the 80s, when he was a teenager, he was a punk rocker listening to the Sex Pistols. And so he brought that interest into academia, created a class on anarchy, where the students create the rules of the class, and the students at the end of the semester grade themselves. You can guess what everybody got. <laughs> Except, he said, the best student in the class gave herself a B plus. Interesting. So what an anarchist would say is, um, when you abolish government, there's not total chaos. Uh, there's a kind of, even though there's an absence of uh, authority or hierarchy, there's a spontaneous order that emerges that is the natural order. Um, people who believe that, that society should be organized this way are called anarcho-syndicalists. 
and the famous intellectual Noam Chomsky is an anarcho-syndicalist. Um, so anarchy is not necessarily what you would have seen in, say, the movie Road Warrior. Anybody seen this? Or, well, there's a remake, right? Mad Max, a new Mad Max. So this is the original one. Uh, it's a pretty bad scene uh, when government breaks down. You've got warlords running amok and tormenting the weak and so on. But um, those who believe in anarchy are saying it's not necessarily chaos. Uh, often, even in an organized, uh, advanced society, something, a problem that you come across is called uh, collective action problem. And it's simply the problem of getting a group of people to cooperate uh, for group benefits and then getting the costs of that action to be paid for equally. So uh, when you guys go out into your careers, you may or may not, you, you may join a union. And you'll find that unions have a, collection, a collective action problem. Um, at Kamehameha, we have a union. But uh, we do not require that teachers pay the dues. So we got down as low as 30% teachers actually paying the dues. But we, no matter whether you pay the dues or not, we spend the union money to defend teachers if they're gonna, if they're under threat of losing their jobs. So that's a collective action problem. Now, one union that solved that problem is HSTA, the Hawaii State Teachers Association, the public teachers union. They're the opposite of us. They, uh, if they sort of set up for you to pay the dues, and if you go to the office and say, I don't believe in unions, I hate unions, I don't want to be a member, they say, that's great. You got to pay us anyway. If you're not a member, pay anyway. So they're the opposite of us. Even if you're not a member, you pay the dues. With us, you're a member, but don't have to pay the dues. So HSTA is one of the rare unions that actually solved that problem. And Hawaii's a big union state. If you plan to work here, good thing to know. Um, that's how a lot of people are able to survive here. They have union jobs. They, uh, they kind of have a lock on certain industries, right? Um, wages tend to be pretty high within the unions. Okay, so this applies again to indigenous people. How can they, let's say, living in rural areas, um, living in in some cases, the tribal society, how can they act collectively? How can they organize to be small fish working together to eat the big fish? This is a good image, but how do you get that group to act as one? That's a, a problem of power. Uh, and in that organizing, you have to try to develop a group identity. Right? Indigenous groups now are pretty heterogeneous in a lot of cases. Uh, they, let's say, intermarried with um, the, the settler society. Um, some native people live on reservations, some live off. Right? Uh, they have membership requirements, their blood quantums. Right? So it, it starts to split up the group. So what is the identity of an indigenous group? This is an issue for Native Hawaiians right now because of the new Supreme Court Justice. Who am I talking about? The newest Supreme Court Justice. U.S. Supreme Court. Starts with K. Matt Damon played him on Saturday Night Live. Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh. Brett Kavanaugh. Brett Kavanaugh is the newest Supreme Court Justice. Uh, his hearing was a big, big fiasco. Maybe we should watch the SNL <laughs> so you can get a sense of it. Um, he was accused of sort of like uh, uh, sexual assault from like high school. And, um, and because of that, all of his sort of high school antics came out, like what he was like back then, all his friends, and they had these crazy nicknames. And um, and uh, what really came to the surface was the kind of, um, oh, I don't know how else to say it, white privilege uh, of especially that kind of East Coast establishment set, right? 
that he was like a, he was at a prep school and the idea that uh, they were entitled to just um, have sex with these uh, girls who are who just because they came to their parties and um, uh, some people call, are calling it a 1980s rape culture it was pretty pretty serious it was a huge huge deal but the reason it's a huge deal for Hawaiians is because while Kavanaugh was in the lower court he wrote um, op-ed pieces in, say, the Wall Street Journal, specifically targeting Native Hawaiian programs, saying that these programs are very suspect. What is a Native Hawaiian? What's the difference between a Native Hawaiian and a, and a Polynesian who migrated to Hawaii in the 1970s? Basically saying that there's no difference. Uh, denying that there is such a thing as a Native Hawaiian. He said, what's the difference between a Native Hawaiian and other Polynesian immigrants? This guy's on the Supreme Court now. So why would that be an issue for, like, say, me and people in my community? There's no such thing as Native Hawaiian. That is a made-up identity. Well, then I think the, the Supreme Court can help you because then you're asking if Native Hawaiian parents are very bad with their lives for their purpose. Right? Yeah, we're talking Hawaiian Homes, a race-based program. OHA, race-based. And what's the other one? Mm -hmm. Schools, which has a, uh, an admissions policy that says you have to be Native Hawaiian. You get preference if you're Native Hawaiian, that's it. It acts, uh, there's no difference between saying there's preference for Native Hawaiians and only Native Hawaiians can get it, right? So if I was in the leadership of Kumameha, I'd be freaking out right now. I don't know what they're thinking, not freaking out. It doesn't seem like they're freaking out. But um, it, it all gets back to this question of identity. This group identity of Native Hawaiian is being questioned by a Supreme Court justice right now. And so all it takes is somebody to uh, apply to Kumameha, who's not Hawaiian, not get in. It goes up to the Supreme Court. They take the case, and Kavanaugh says there's no such thing as Native points. All these programs are unconstitutional. Um, but it gets back to this. All of these pictures here uh, are about an example of the formation of identity, group identity, that, that's always fascinated me, and that's the identity of, uh, of Germans. Um, Germany is younger than Hawaii as a country. It only came into existence in 1871. Before that, it was small states, like Prussia was the biggest one, but city-states, and they had to create an, an identity to say that we're gonna be this larger country called Germany, because they had to have a bigger country that could be competitive economically against, say, England and France. And so part of that project was people like uh, Wagner, the, the composer Wagner. Um, he wrote, uh, Oops. Ride of the Valkyries or Flight of the Valkyries. You heard the expression, it's not over till the fat lady sings, right? That is a direct reference to Wagner's opera, Flight of the Valkyries, because it's a four hour opera and everybody's sitting through it and it's like, when is this thing gonna end? They're like, okay, that's the end. No, it's not, it keeps going. <laughs> okay, that must be the end. No, it's not, it keeps going. And so people who had seen it were telling people who hadn't seen it, it's not over until the fat lady sings, and that's that. Uh, uh, if you heard it, you'd recognize that, clim that climax part of the opera. So what Wagner was doing was using this sort of um, uh, uh, Teutonic Nordic legend of the Valkyries and uh, trying to create this kind of German heritage to say we are all Germans no matter whether you're from Prussia or um, Hamburg or Baden or Württemberg, which were all separate initially, were all Germanic, right? And then they created a state of Germany only, you know, 150 years ago. Uh, so Nietzsche, who was mentioned in the video, was critical of that. He's saying there's no uh, glorious German origin. In fact, there's no glorious origin of anyone. If you go back all the way, uh, we're all apes because um, evolution had just been discovered about 20 years before this. 
And so that's not glorious at all. We're all sort of low, low level creatures. And so uh, Wagner and Nietzsche used to be good friends, but they kind of had a split over this question in this uh, project of forming a German identity. But any kind of identity is, uh, you know, to some extent negotiated. We could go on and on about that, but we can come back to it. Okay, so that's all uh, different aspects of power. What about sources of power? Um, <coughs> these are some that, that uh, sharp lists. Right, um, but power is this really nebulous thing. Um, I think of it a little bit differently. When I think of power, I think of four things. Uh, violence, knowledge, law, and wealth. And those are forms of power. We're, we're, in a, we're in a kind of a superhero culture right now, right? Hollywood only makes superhero movies. So when we think of power, we think of like superpowers. People say, what's your superpower, right? Um, think of like wizards with lightning bolts shooting out and stuff like that. But no, power is, is those four things or skills. Um, but there's always some kind of intangible factor. You know, when, when you see somebody who has leadership ability, it's hard to put your finger on what exactly that is, but you know it when you see it, right? Um, it could be, it's something like charisma, right? And um, one reason... Some people say Al Gore lost in the year 2000 to a very unqualified candidate, George W. Bush. Uh, some people say, well, the reason he lost is, um, uh, you know, charisma. You know it when you see it, and you know he didn't have it. You know Gore didn't have it, no matter how qualified he was. Um, it's this intangible thing. Um, but this picture here is a reference to, uh, you know, King Louis the Fourteenth, who would say that uh, uh, he is the state. He was called the Sun King. That he was. Um, he's kind of the example of authority being granted from God, right? So in the old days, in Europe at least, and even <coughs> in a lot of native societies, the idea is the gods come down and grant authority. So in Hawaiian, it's through genealogy. Right? Uh, chiefs are the descendants of gods. But around the late 1700s, the idea started to arise that power um, comes from below, that uh, you, you grant the government power through a, by giving a contract, making a contract, a social contract. And that's what John Locke was talking about. So that's the question of authority. Um, Sharp talks about obedience. Like, you don't have power unless people obey. And there's so many more people than there are leadership, right? And yet they obey. Um, they might fear sanctions. They might fear, they might believe that, uh, that, that king is divine. Um, they might have an investment in the system. Like, take North Korea. North Korea is a very, it's a pretty bad situation from almost everybody in the country, but there is a layer of elites in North Korea who benefit from the system. And so they they have an investment in the system. They want it to continue, as bad as it is. Um, okay, there's also identify identification with the ruler. This picture here is Idi Amin. Pretty. Um, horrific leader in, in um, Uganda and you know, he really used to say like I'm a farmer I am you I'm no different from you and there's a bit of that with the Trump rhetoric okay but with any of these things in, in the obedience is not inevitable right uh, people's authority doesn't always stay at the same level. In fact, there's a book um, that really gets into the core of this that says, you know what, it's called The Paradox of Power. And what happens is that usually you're, the way you get power is 
doing things that benefit you, right? If you do things that benefit the group, you're sort of selfless, self-sacrificing to do things that benefit everybody else. And people see that, and so they push you up into positions of leadership, right? So in other words, you're doing things that are pro-social, and so you're lifted up. But that process of being lifted up, when you get lifted up, there's something that gets triggered in a human mind that um, causes those people to start then doing antisocial behaviors. Right? They say um, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. You've heard that expression? Well, that's been tested in the laboratory hundreds of times and found to be without a doubt true. There's something that happens to your mind when you're given power. So the same thing that got you into power is you start doing the opposite and then you see these dramatic falls from power. Yeah? I think it's psychology. Yeah, they're saying it's psychology. And so that brings up the question, like, what do you do, right? If you become someone who's put into power, how do you avoid it? And the, the author of this book says, um, most people aren't aware that they're doing it. Like, as soon as they start to do these antisocial behaviors, they start justifying it really. You know, you can justify a lot of things, right? So they start justifying it. And, um, but if you know that that's, a, that that's a risk, you know that that's going to happen to you, you can actually mentally keep yourself from starting to do those things. You can be sort of selfless. I was just going to say, like, Leaders are going power and don't kind of fall yeah. off. Yeah. Is hierarchy an ideology? Yeah, it is an ideology. Oh, that's a great question, actually. That's, that's like kind of what Pandora's box. Um, because uh, the kind of, like when we're talking about Foucault, Foucault to me is the harbinger, the um, person who starts to introduce the, uh, the concept of uh, what they call postmodern, postmodernism. Postmodern is a meaning simply after modern. So postmodernism is, uh, there's a lot of things to say about it, but um, one of the main things is that they're against hierarchy. And the reason they're against hierarchy because they can name so many abusive hierarchies in the past. I mean, for one thing, the Catholic Church, right? The Catholic Church is pretty well known for being corrupt. That's why there was a Protestant revolution and hundreds of other churches that splintered off of the Catholic Church. Because originally there was only the Catholic Church. So it's pretty corrupt. Uh, a lot of state governments, uh, apparatus are, are corrupt. Um, social class is kind of corrupt. We have a lot of films about that, right? If you marry a poor guy, marries a rich girl, then the, the tension that causes or vice versa, right? Corrupt social classes. And so, uh, postmodernism, you might say, is the ideology that um, tries to dismantle hierarchies. But that it's not as great or perfect as it sounds, because it seems that some hierarchies are, in fact, inherent, right, and natural. And, uh, and you, you really can't live without them. Like most postmodernists, they want to it's not for every hierarchy, except for one, and that is undergrad, graduate student, assistant professor, associate professor, co-professor, tenure, all those. They don't want to dismantle that hierarchy, because that's a hierarchy in which this discourse is happening. Right? You're in a hierarchy right now. And that one they don't want to dismantle. Except maybe my, uh, my professor friend at Cornell, you would say, no, I, you and I were all exactly the same, <laughs> even though he has a PhD from Yale and he's a tenured professor at Cornell. He might say that, but most wouldn't, yeah. So would hierarchy be equivalent to behavior? There certainly seem to be some natural hierarchies. Um, I mean, they're very basic, right? Uh, like in science, there's hierarchies that there's levels of organization that are some seem to be higher than others. They're more organized. 
um, atoms and molecules, right? Like that. That, that seems to be a hierarchy that's, that's inherent, uh, just to go to the most basic one that nobody can deny. Um, and so uh, just to keep in mind, as you, if you go into graduate school, you're going to be facing this world where hierarchy is very much the enemy. And how do you negotiate that when it, uh, there's something, it's not quite as simple as that. OK? Because um, one thing about postmodernists is that they're very good at critiquing uh, the system. They're not so good at, uh, at offering alternatives. That, that's true of Foucault as well. Foucault was really good at critiquing the system, but what was his alternative? Well, actually, he liked living in the bourgeois system. Um, he was known for being very, very meticulous about place settings at his apartment, like when he hosted his friends, like, look, Super, you know, high class dude. <laughs> like, everything's just so, it's all, um, that's not dismantling hierarchy. It's fully being part of it. Um, but still, I don't want to disregard postmodernism. I'm just saying that um, it, it's not, doesn't seem to be the final thing. Um, for the most part, this is, this is a valid, a valid statement. Because we're talking mainly about very oppressive regimes here, right? Like uh, the book, Sharp's book, From Dictatorship to Democracy. He's not saying from slightly flawed democracies to a utopia. He's talking about full dictatorships to a democracy that functions. Right? You wouldn't want to live under this guy. Yeah. And the point remains, all government is based on consent. Um, power can be controlled based on three factors. Okay, how much do the people want to keep the leader in power? Um, how strong are the citizens' institutions? This is where we get into that notion of civil society, right? Uh, organized society outside of the formal institutions, outside of government, universities, um, corporations, just um, non-profits, that, that kind of thing is, is um, that's what we're talking about. So like, let's say the Sierra Club, um, Common Cause, right, all these organizations that try to make the world better, they're not government funded. That they're citizens institutions, right? And then, uh, to what extent are subjects willing to to withhold their consent. So will you engage in a boycott? If Apple is abusing um, uh, workers in their factories, are you willing to boycott Apple and not have an iPhone? Right? What's your willingness level? OK. Um, Tolstoy was actually very close by correspondence. He had a long correspondence with, with Gandhi. And based on that understanding of the Indian movement, Leo Tolstoy said this, and Gandhi had a similar quote as well. What does it mean that 30,000 men have subdued 200 million? Do not the figures make it clear that it is not the English who have enslaved the Indians, but the Indians themselves? In other words, they are to some extent cooperating. Um, there, uh, in the British colonization of India, there were um, what is called the Raj, which are kings of districts were, which were allowed to stay in place and as long as they cooperated with the British. So there had to be some kind of Indian cooperation. Uh, sometimes they used the different religions in India one against another. So there's some cooperation in that sense too. And so when there's non-cooperation, um, leadership starts to suffer. The quote from President Truman when Eisenhower came into the presidency. He said, Eisenhower is president. Now, Eisenhower had been a general, right? A military man. Eisenhower will sit here, he'll say, do this, do that, and nothing will happen. Poor Ike. That's what they called Eisenhower. Uh, it won't be a bit like the army. He'll find it very frustrating. 
because the United States is a democracy and the military is not, right? So when you're in a leadership position in a democracy, it's quite different. I think that's what Trump is experiencing, right? His, his organization is not even publicly held. It, you can't buy a share, you can't buy stock in Trump, yeah? The owner of Trump organization is Trump alone, no one else, yeah? It's a privately held entity. And so he's used to being kind of like Eisenhower, just giving orders and, and you know, make it so. But uh, that's not how, you know, <laughs> the United States works. There's division of power. Okay. Questions or comments? Uh, well, there's the way that I mentioned earlier. Let's see, which one was that? This one? Um, okay, so thinking of the American system, uh, American system is kind of weird because um, imagine if you ran for a very high office, like you're Tulsi Gabbard and you're running for president, right? You guys heard of Tulsi Gabbard running for president. Um, how would you have to think about yourself in order to Pretty highly, right? <laughs> um, so, first of all, it selects for people who think incredibly highly of themselves, probably too highly. Right? It selects for them, and then it, and the system requires that you go out and you basically brag about yourself for months and months on end. Right? That's what you do. And but there's a system in place where if you can pass certain thresholds, then system helps you to uh, get into those positions. Um, so the parties, for example, uh, the Democratic Party, they kind of have a sense of there's only a few people in the party who are we're willing to put forward. So they kind of stifle Bernie Sanders. That seems pretty much proven. And it's going to be Hillary. Now there might have been some others that would have been accepted. Bernie wasn't. Right? So that structure allows Hillary to be one of the last two. Um, so it's a combination of your personal attributes. And, but what I'm getting at is at the end, you usually end up choosing the lesser of two evils, right? Um, some of my relatives, when they're, they said they would vote for Trump, and when people would ask them, why would you possibly do that? They would say, because never Hillary. It's not even about Trump. It's just not Hillary's choice. Because that's the only choice they have. I mean, this is the crazy one. In 2004, your choice of president was, did I talk about this before? In 2004, your choice for president was this member, uh, one member of uh, a secret society called Skull and Bones from Yale, or this member of the secret society called Skull and Bones from Yale. That was it. Two members of Skull and Bones from Yale. That was your only choice. George W. Bush and John Kerry, right? There's no other choice. Your president was going to be from this little tiny super elite group at Yale. That's what it was. And so that, that's structural. That's not like people looked at everybody possibly qualified for president and said, oh, we only want people from Yale, from Skull and Bones. No, they didn't do that. They were structured. They got from there. Once you're there, you choose based on often the lesser two. I've heard of people who voted for Bush because they liked his face better than George's face. Well, pretty intangible. <laughs> but the fact is that's your, your only two choices at that point. Sometimes it's a third choice, but it's never quite 
a serious one, right? Ralph Nader, uh, there was Gary Johnson in this last election for Libertarians. Um, uh, there was a few way back, but um, not really serious. Most likely they just switched the election for the other guy. But yeah, still, there's always this intangible thing there. Um, when I see people with leadership ability, I, I still can't uh, name what that is. Is that a question? Oh. oh. Good questions. Anything, any others? Okay, let's, um, let's take a five minute break. Um, no, let's take a 10 minute break, but part of that break is gonna be you, so the second half, try to think of um, a form of nonviolent protest that is not one of uh, the 198. And I'm not saying that I've memorized all 198. Uh, I did. I do know a couple more that aren't listed in there, so there must be others. There's just a little mental activity. Okay, so sort of like a five-minute break and a five-minute brainstorm. 